Okay, so this is going to be black hat locksmithing. Uh, in case you've been living on another planet for the last 10 years, we all know the difference between black hat and white hat, right? Yeah? No? Okay, well, if you don't. A black hat is someone in the digital world who uses their skills for bad, for evil, basically nefarious purposes. And a white hat is someone who uses them for ethical reasons, to help people, not steal from them. All right, so I'm Matt Smith, otherwise known as Huxley Pig from a lot of popular internet forums. I started off my career as a software developer in COBOL, of all things, which makes me sound like 80. <laughs> but I'm led to believe this company still develop new things in COBOL, even to this day, believe it or not. And I was a white, a black hat and a white hat locksmith. And now I pretty much look for holes in anything, digital, physical. And when I make, when I find a hole, I like to make a tool to exploit that hole. And uh, what you can see in the picture here, this is a uh, lockfall towers. So this is where all the magic happens, if you like. It's actually my man cave, it's, it's my cellar. But I don't live with my parents. Right, so locksmiths are the good guys, right? Not always. Okay, so this is a subject that I've very rarely seen broached before. And I suppose there are good reasons for a lot of that. So uh, hopefully I'm not gonna be crossing the line into you know, criminality. We're gonna look at some high security locks later on and some prison breaks and some thievery, that sort of thing. So I'm not going to be releasing any classified material. Um, that's not really my place. But I will be releasing stuff that I've never released, but it's my own work. So like I say, it's not going to be a lesson in how to steal, and I'm not going to be showing anyone else's stuff. All right, so locks themselves are security devices, right? So they only exist in order to keep your valuables safe, to stop people you don't want coming into your house. So anyone with nefarious intent, obviously, is going to have a real interest in getting through these things. And it brings us back to the age-old adage that locks only keep honest people out, which by and large is true. If someone wants to get through your lock badly enough, then, you know, they're going to do that. Or they'll smash your window. So circa 4000 BC, this is like the first example of a pin tumbler lock from Egypt. Now, this question fascinates me. Could this lock have been picked? Well, yeah, it's wooden, right? Of course it could have been picked. But was it picked? In actuality? Well, that's harder to say. So, like if an archaeologist found, say, one of these keys here, but it was only a bit of the key, they'd probably just think it was a broken key, not a lockpick. But uh, I posit that, yeah, if people were smart enough to make these devices, then there must have been other people around that were smart enough to pick them, right? So, black hats have been around ever since locks themselves, in my opinion. So, can anyone think of any motivations? Why might someone want to pick a lock that doesn't belong to them? Treasure, right? Theft, yeah? Filthy cold Luca. <laughs> He's enjoying it, isn't he? And lockpicking text brings with it a group of like unique problems. So we can say for definite that most thefts are forced entry. That's that's a definite. But the exact amount that are done by locksmithing means, and by locksmithing means I mean picking, impressioning, bumping, bypassing, any of the techniques that a locksmith might use to get through your front door, non-destructive. And this figure of three to six percent. Well, it's really hard to pin down. Like, these are from various police forces, I found these figures. And... Does it include bypass? Right, yes, 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 so non-destructive, yeah. Okay. Impressioning, well, we're gonna cover warded impressioning later, but the Yoss, the geezer here, just asked the question. Um, he's actually gonna be doing a talk on impressioning tomorrow, on pin tumbler impressioning. So, it, it's basically a way of taking a blank key go into the lock and then you put it in, you file it and then at the end of it all you have a working key for that lock without any knowledge of the lock beforehand. So that's what impressioning is. But the problem with locksmithing methods like this is that it leaves no obvious sign that it's actually happened, right? So if you come home and your lock, your door is open and the lock looks like it hasn't been touched, there's no signs of forced entry, you don't know what's happened. Like. Locksmithing methods do leave forensic traces, but in order to find them, you'd have to take the lock out, you'd have to take it to a forensic locksmith, they'd have to look at it under a microscope, and there'd be telltale scratches and little marks that'd give away what happens. But of course, this only happens in the most high, high profile of cases. That's not going to happen with like your average burglary. So that's going to serve to keep this 3 to 6% number down, right? Then you get the insurance issues, you get the like age old bit of advice delivered by people with 
usually little to no legal training. So if you come home and this scenario happens, they say, well, lock the door, kick the door in, right? Or smash the window. Give the insurance company something to go on so that they can say, yeah, there's been a forced entry. Because otherwise they'll try and worm out of it, right? They'll try and say, well, you must have been negligent with your leaving at the keys. Or maybe you just left it unlocked, right? And again, that keeps this 3 to 6% number down. Another unique problem you get with lock picking theft is skimming. So let's say you've got a parking meter and a local thief can pick the lock on this parking meter. So instead of coming after the end of a busy day and emptying that parking meter completely, what if the thief only takes 5% of what's in there and locks the lock back up again? <clears throat> this can really easily go under the radar. It can go unnoticed for years, believe me. And again, that keeps this number down, right? And like I said earlier, with the insurance, blame often falls on the key holders. So let's say you're the manager of this parking company. You know that someone's been opening the locks. You know that someone's been locking them back up and taking the money, right? So you first thought, must be someone with a key, right? Or it must have been someone who had access to a key and copied it. And again, that keeps this number down. So it's, it's difficult. Okay, so other motivations for lock picking? Escape, obviously. I don't think this guy can pit locks. I might be doing him an injustice, but uh, I don't think his escape went too well as evidenced by the people taking pictures of him stuck in the wall. <laughs> and the alphabet super authorities, right? KGB, MIA, you know, those things. They've been into lock picking ever since they've existed, right? Recently, there's been some Stasi that, tools that have been declassified or they've come to the fore, because obviously the Stasi don't exist anymore, right? And some of their tools are the most intricate and beautifully designed things I've ever seen. They're like pieces of art within their own right, if you ask me. And they should be right, because these guys have got all of our money, loads of our money to spend on creating the very best designs, the very best manufacturing techniques. Which is a shame, right? Because like I say, these things are often works of art, but because of the very nature, you, you very rarely get to see them, which is why the Stars' tools are so good that they've come out. And if you want, the, I don't include the Stars' tools in this talk, but like I can point you in the right direction. Come and find me in the lock picking village if you want to know more about any of this stuff. So like the Alphabet Super Authority is going to want to get into your property or whatever using two methods, surreptitious or covert. So let's get this the right way around. Covert is the one we was talking about earlier that leaves tiny traces, but only if you look at it through a microscope. Surreptitious, however, this is as if the key itself has been used. It's as if, you know, nothing untoward has happened. And tools that are surreptitious entry, like the holy grail of the alphabet soup agencies. And it brings the question, right, what are these guys anyway? Are the black hat? Are the white hat? Are the grey hat? You know, it, it, it's like this shift in line. I mean, it, it depends on what your nationality, political motivations. You know, it can be hard to say. I can attest to this as well. Another motivation for lot picking theft can just be challenge, right, or boredom. I mean, there's been plenty of examples throughout history where people have just done it because they were bored, right? And there's, there's always going to be some other crazy reason why someone wants to pick a lock that doesn't belong to them, right? Look at the teeth on that thing. But seriously, if you were like a medieval Casanova, you'd need to know how to get through these things, right? Otherwise, it's going to get pretty uncomfortable. Okay, so confession is good for the soul, so here we go. This depicts confession, if you didn't know. Um, so in a former life, my intentions for getting into lock picking probably weren't entirely virtuous, shall we say. And I had a particular penchant for vending machines, okay? These were like, I um, saw it's uh, low hanging fruit, right? I was never interested in taking off people. This seemed perfect, too good to be true. But it's okay. It soon came about the challenge to me of actually opening these things. And I came over to the good side. And thus the color of my hat was changed. But I shouldn't have to say this, right? But I am gonna say this. Don't break into vending machines or car parking meters. Okay, standard disclaimer. And just to underline this, right? There was a guy last year who was breaking into parking meters. And uh, he wasn't using locksmithing methods, but he most certainly was stealing the money. And uh, he got a suspended sentence, but in a first of its kind, he got a five-year injunction banning him from going near any coin-operated machines <laughs> at all. 
And it came with a load of ludicrous sounding caveats. So like if he needed to go on holiday to an airport and he needed to park his car, then he could go up to the machine, but only once for 30 seconds and he couldn't return to the machine for another four hours. And it, lots of silly things like this. But this could make life really impractical, right? You couldn't use the self-service at Tesco, right? Oh, we're in Surrey. Waitrose. <laughs> Don't let it be, right? Enough of the disclaimer. Okay, so here's some, some lock-picking thieves. Deacon Brodie, he was in Edinburgh. His floro it was in the mid-18th century. Apparently Robert Louis Stevenson based Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde on this guy. Because during the day, as you can see, he was a very respectable town councillor, pillar of the community, this guy. But by night, Deacon Brodie changed. He was also a talented locksmith. Which was good, right? Because his high status in society got him jobs either servicing or installing rich people's locks. So what he'd do is he'd put the locks in, he'd make a copy of the key, go home, finish the copy, and come back that night and rob them blind. So pretty much exclusively, he was going to be up against what we call warded locks. Now, this is pretty much defunct technology now. And if you look about three rows down and four and fifth keys in, you can see like the fat looking keys with the fat ends. So if Brody didn't already have an impression or, you know, if he hadn't already copied the key, he'd have used this method of impressioning. So what this entails is taking the blank, putting some impressionable material on it, either soot or wax or whatever, and you'd insert it into the lock, turn it till it hit the wards so it wouldn't go any further. And when you took it out, you'd have an impression of where you needed to file in order to make this key work, which is what I used to do. This is where the skeleton key terms come from because you're removing as much metal as you can from that key and just leaving the bare minimum in order for it to operate. So another one of Brody's favourite tricks was uh, he'd walk around Edinburgh during the day and uh, he'd go into workshops and talk to the workmen, making idle chit-chat. And he'd always have a blob of putty in his pocket. And if an opportune moment arose, he'd take a key that was hanging around, take an impression of it in the putty, go home, copy the key, rob them blind that night. So his crime spree went for 11 years. One of the highlights, he stole £800 from a bank. Now, he already had the key. He installed the locks again. But you've got to realise how much £800 was back in the 18th century, right? This, this was a lot of money. Now, Brody was very busy. He, at night time, he lost fortunes on cockfighting, gambling. He had a wife, two mistresses, six children. So, and he was already wealthy. His dad had left him a lot of money. He had the temerity to steal the ceremonial mace from Edinburgh University. Now, I think it was never returned, right? Because I can't find a picture of it. This isn't the mace, and that's not Deacon Brodie. But it is a ceremonial mace, okay? So things started to unravel for him when his gang decided to rob the revenues of Scotland. Now, what this was in practicality was the taxes that all the Scottish people had been paying. They were held in the customs, well, the excise building. So his gang tried to burgle it. It was bungled, and they only got away with £16 or something. But further on, about two months later, I think, two of the gang got arrested for different things. And as it happens, they never breathed a word about Brody to the police. But Brody didn't know this, and he got spooked when he heard that they'd been arrested. And so he fled, and that did bring suspicion upon him. Ultimately, he was found carrying in a cupboard in a hotel in Holland. He was brought back to Edinburgh, hanged in front of 40,000 people after a 21-hour trial. But it's not all bad, right? He's got a couple of pubs named after him, and a cafe. Sorry? Is, have you been there? Yeah. Cheers, Deacon. Okay, I really like this guy, the phone ranger. This is the best picture I could find of him, I'm sorry. So, James Clark, an American guy, a tool maker and die maker from Ohio. He was active from 81 to 88, and specifically, he stole from payphones. So, at some point during his career, he thought, I've had enough of making tools, I'm going to rob telephones instead. <laughs> he used James Bell as a pseudonym when he used to go into CD motels and he's arrested by the feds in his caravan. He went quietly in the end. So this is the telephones he was robbing on the left. On the right is an example of the lock. We're going to look at this a little more closer now. The Western Electric 30C. So apparently, Western Electric spent a million dollars developing this thing. So by the 70s, yeah, that's a lot of money. This was the days of the $6 million man. So this gets you, what, his leg? You know, this was like the, the height of technology, really. So one of the problems is the keyways wiggly. We, we don't need to go into that too much. Eight levers. Each of the levers has false gates. But 
we can forget about all this and, and the spring. Really, this isn't what makes the lock secure. Lots of locks have these features. The crowning glory of this thing is the lever grabber, okay? So in the top left-hand corner, you can see like this toothed contraption, and that's the lever grabber. So as you turn the key, the levers move up to their heights. And when the key gets to about 12 o'clock, this lever grabber engages. So on the right-hand side, we can see that the grabber's engaged. You can see them notches at the top of the levers that sort of eating into. So at that point, the levers are immobile, you can't move them. And it's only after that that the stump gets pushed into the levers or not. So normal lock picking theory would tell us that you tension the lock and this stump is going to be pushing against the levers and you pick the levers against this stump and the feedback from that tells you what's happening inside the lock. Well, that's impossible with this because before that can ever happen, the locks are immobilized. But James Clark could pick them, which tells you what a massive achievement this was. His seven-year crime spree covered 32 of America's 50 states. According to the feds, he liked to spend summer in the east and winter in the west. Apparently, he went up and down in State 40, and he'd just branch off to towns either side of it and go up and down and up and down. Just do that. So as his crime spree gained momentum, he was on America's Most Wanted twice. There was a $25,000 reward for his arrest. And like I say, this guy's the only man who has ever pit this lock, allegedly. I've got an example of the lock here. Whoa. No, not that. It's okay. So if any of you think you can think of a way to pick this, I would be really interested. I can't pick it and I've tried it. There's a couple of techniques that might work, but there's not enough hours in a lifetime, right? But the feds can say that he was the only guy to pick them because they forensically examined every single telephone lock and all of them left distinctive scratches were allegedly from his tool, which was made from piano wire. I've also heard other reports that it was actually quite sophisticated. But piano wire seems to smack of simplicity, and I think it probably was simple. The best ideas are always the simplest, right? But frustratingly, yeah, uh, we have never seen the tool, ever. The Fed's never released it. Clark, if he's still alive, he'd be in his late 70s, and there's no reason to suggest he's not taking the secret to his grave. But these are the best kind of puzzles, right? Because you know there's a solution. You've just got to find it. So different reports say you earn 400 grand to over a million dollars, 57K is 140K a year, which isn't a bad earning in change. So let's say this guy earned a million dollars, that's four million quarters, which I'm reliably informed looks like this. Now that is just incredible, right? Where would you keep all that? So he got sentenced to three consecutive one year terms, so he got three years in total on a plea bargain. But um, funnier than that, he was ordered to repay $802.50 back to our oh, pal. <laughs> so if we say he robbed a million and it cost them a million, they're, they're doing pretty badly out of this deal, right? Okay, let's look at some prison escapes. We all like prison escapes, don't we? So I, I love this. This was like for sale on eBay recently. So this, this attests to the ingenuity of man. Like you've got pics and stuff made here from what? forks and spoons and buttons and wire and you know all manner of things i've heard of um lock picking tools in prison being made out of bars of soap and um sporks plastic sporks you know so let's go back in time mr doody i don't know his first name and this isn't him believe it or not but i couldn't find a picture so this guy invented a lock from wolverhampton and um he's lot used something called the secret principle now all that means is there was a secret to open it so in this case, you'd put the key in, and if you turn the key, nothing would happen. You'd have to turn the key, move it to a specific position, then it would go in again, and then it would work like the normal key. And this is otherwise known as security through obscurity. In the 1800s, this might have been a, a great model, but in today's internet days, you know, a secret can be across the internet in seconds, so it's a pretty crappy model now. He happened to service the jails in Stafford, the locks in Stafford Jail, sorry, which was fortunate because he ended up being locked up there eight years later. So he picked his way out, but he wasn't on the run for long. He feared recriminations for his family, and also he thought he'd get a longer sentence if he was caught while on the run, which he probably would have, right? So he picked his way back into prison. The story goes that um, the warden came around in the morning to the head count, and he was sitting in his cell again as if nothing had happened. And we can't talk about jailbreakers without talking about Jack Shepard, right? We're going to come into modern times after this guy. It's okay. So this guy was only 22 when he was uh, hanged, eventually. He was a general vagabond, ruffian, scoundrel. He was only a little, five foot four inches, but he was renowned for breaking through strong room doors and for going through walls, breaking through walls and seemingly impossible things to break through. Solid oak floorboards. 
Gentleman Jack, as he was otherwise known, his first escape was my favourite. He escaped from jail four times. From the hangman's noose, in fact. He was sentenced to death all four times. But I like his first one best. So there were some metal bars on the window, and he managed to pry one of these metal bars loose. And he used that to go through the ceiling, went through some floorboards. But then when he got up to one of the high windows, he noticed he couldn't get down to the ground. So what, what did Jack do? This is like the archetypal prison escape. Come on. What did Jack do? Anyone know? Can anyone think? Brilliant. Yes. This is the first ever recorded example I can find of this. So future prison escapes owe a lot to Jack. He went back to his cell. He tore up strips from his bed sheets. He made it into a rope. So Jack the Lad, as he was also known. His second prison escape was dubbed the sex and prison, sexiest prison break of all time. So his missus, Edgeworth Bess, came to visit him in jail. And um, the jailers recognised her as one of the, his accomplices, so they threw her in with him. But they didn't leave any bed sheets. They weren't going to let Jack pull the same trick. And yet he did. He pulled the same trick. So where did he get the material from? Of course, right? So it, here's a cutting from a photograph of the time. And I'm led to believe that this is actually a lot more modest than it was in reality. She was pretty much naked, I think, when she was lowered down. Now, the idea was for Jack to leave one of the bars in the window so he could anchor the rope to it. But as it turns out, Bess was a little more ample than that. So she couldn't fit through. And so he lowered her down himself. But it didn't end well for Jack, I'm afraid. At the age of 22, he's hanged. He's got it four times. And this is his hanging, depicted from this. These pictures here, rather morbidly. You can see he's to the gallows on the top one. In the middle one, he's been cut down. And in the bottom one, it seems like he's been held aloft on the crowd in some sort of bizarre corpse crowd surfing ritual. I, I don't really know what was going on there, but apparently there wasn't much left of it afterwards either, the corpse, which is, which is nice, isn't it? Okay, Pretoria. Jenkins and Lee. Okay, they were political prisoners, right? Now, put it in inverted commas, because um, they were anti-apartheid but they were distributing them using explosives, right? So they got sentenced to eight and 12 years, respectively. So there's 14 locked doors between them and freedom. And um, they managed to make keys out of wood. They mainly impression keys from wood. And later on, they did a couple of metal keys. This is Lee or, or Jenkins, I don't really know. And on the left here, we can see a couple of, well, the top two are the wooden keys, the bottom two are examples of the metal keys. And there he is holding one of his wooden keys. You can have a wooden key that works perfect, right? And there's a problem getting out of a cell door, yeah? The, can anyone think of why you wouldn't be able to use a key on the inside of a cell door? There's no keyhole, yeah. And so they had to devise this um, crazy crankshaft thing from a broom hanging up in the cell. And here it is. That's the end of it. So that's pretty ingenious. But this was just the first door, okay? That to go through another 13 doors after this. And remember, these guys weren't locksmiths before they went to prison. This is an astonishing achievement. And like I say, there was 14 doors, so they'd get through one door, and then the next night they'd get a bit further, and the next night they'd get a bit further. So this wasn't one prison escape. This was multiple, multiple, multiple prison escapes. And these guys are still free. Oh, I left the Twizzle PowerPoint animation in. Oh, I think we can call it a day. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, sorry. I apologize. Right. Bear in my prison break, Darwin. So Daniel Heiss and some other guy got convicted of killing a man because apparently they wanted his rifles. So hell of a reason to kill someone, right? He already escaped once. He pretended he was ill. He got transferred to the, the, prison, the hospital prison ward. Guess how he escaped? Can anyone guess how he escaped? And I'll, it, we've already seen it as a clue. Yeah, of course. Again, apparently his in, individual twist on it is he intertwined wires with... The bed sheets as well, but thank you, Jack. But later on, anyway, in his sentence, he was transferred to Barry Mar Darwin. In there, he met another inmate called Barker. Now, he was a jeweler on the outside, and he was a long-term inmate, so he'd been given certain privileges, which bizarrely included jewelry making equipment, right? So he thought, I oh, know, I'm going to get this guy to make a key so I can escape. But um, the, re the real brilliant bit about the story is where he got the key from. So... Whenever anyone, whenever anyone went to Barry Mar Prison, right, they were uh, given like an induction book saying, welcome to the prison, here's what to do, here's not what to do. On the cover of this book were the master keys to the prison. 
That's a fail, right? That's a security fail. So these both escaped. Heist left a note saying this bird has flown in his cell. Baker injured himself on getting over a wall on the outside. He was captured soon. It took a little longer to recapture Heiss. But Heiss is now out. He's a landscape gardener and artist. This is an example of some of his uh, artwork, shall we say. Okay, secret tools. How are we doing on time? Oh, wow, awesome. Okay, so this is my favorite tool ever, right? It's uh, for seven pin tumblers. It's for like the cheap ones you can see on the right here. Now this has been around for a long time, right? Since the seventies. And it works via a method of self impressioning. So what that means is you get the tool, you put it in the lock and on the cheap and nasty ones, you give it a wiggle and sometimes within seconds it'll open. And even better, right? You can lock the collar down afterwards and use it as a key from then on, or you can go and get the bittings and say, okay, this is a two, this is a four, etc., and go and actually make a key up. You can also use it for SPP, so by that I mean single pin picking. So uh, you can put the tool in the lock and then push down on each of these little fingers. So it's, it's a really cool tool. It's the closest thing to a James Bond tool I've ever seen, it really is. Ex except for the actual James Bond tools that, that the spooks have got. But even 15 years ago, right, it was pretty rare that you'd find a tubular lock on a vending machine. A cheap and nasty one. So they decided to change the designs to fool this, to foil this very tool. So this tool, anyone can buy this tool, this isn't a secret. But the modifications to the tool, which I'm going to talk about, are pretty rare. Well, I've never seen them. So first we're going to talk about this. This is a laptop light lock. I don't know if you've ever seen this, Kensington. The twist on this that defeats this very tool, can you see on the end of the key, I've circled it, there's like a nib, and that nib lives inside of the red rectangle that you can see on the lock. By the way, I've but the, the lock shouldn't look like this on, on your laptop. This is one of my locks that I've butchered, so that, that big gash out of the right, ignore that. Right, so this nib, what it serves to do is it keeps a trap pin down, so if you come along with this tool, it's actually really cheap and nasty, it impressions really quickly, but You'll go, oh, you're brilliant, I'll pick the lock. And it'll go around a little bit, and they go, click. And then this trap pin will fire up in, into this little hole, this rectangle. And from that point onwards, the lock's locked. It, 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 it doesn't matter how much you pick it or whatever, or supposedly, it's not budging. And it's also coloured red. It's meant to be like um, a tamper evident lock. So if you come to it and see the little red, but you know someone's been trying to pick it with this. But can anyone see a way that you might be able to get around this? Right, okay, yeah, so copy the key, yeah? Just put something in the hole, doesn't matter what it is, it could be paper, it could be a bit of metal, I call them Kensington adapters. <laughs> could be anything, right? And also, um, if you fire the trap pin, uh, it's just on a spring, so you can just push it back down again, put something in the hole and use this. So this is like security through obscurity again, right? Someone, some soon you know how it works, it's rubbish. So this is another one. Another twist on this design. Now, how these got around it is the pins aren't in the same places as they are on here. Now, you can get dedicated picks for this, but you can see in the middle picture, they added this shroud. Now, what that does, it offers a little bit of drill resistance, but more than that, it's to foil this pick again. And you need a pick that's shaped similar to the bottom picture. So it's got like, you know, a thin arm. And there was one of these a while ago from H. PC, they made it, but I've not seen that for a while. But again, it's very easy to get around as, as soon as you've got a tool that resembles the key, the, the neck of the key at the bottom. Forget about it. Oh, Camlock Systems. All right. So can anyone see what Camlock Systems did here to, to change the di design from the regular standard pin, the seven pin tubular lock? I've highlighted it in red just in case. Uh, okay, yeah, so they changed the circle to an octagon, okay? A quantum leap forward in design, lock design technology. Or at least they think it is, right? So they changed the circle to an octagon. Cunning, right? Now as it happens, this lock's rubbish. It's really bad tolerances. 
you can single pin pick it and you can impression it using a tool which hmm how do you think you might make a tool for that do you think maybe i could change the round bit for an octagonal bit do you think maybe that would work maybe yeah so it's obvious right that's what you need to do but um this tool doesn't exist and i was baffled by this i was like what doesn't exist should exist right no so a while ago right um i was on a forum and I just posted a list of locks that I wanted to make tools for. And as it happened, their lock happened to be in this list. And that was it, right? I just said, I would like to do this maybe some point in the future. They didn't like this. They got onto the forum owner, threatened him with prosecution and subpoena if he didn't give up my IP address. And the intention was to serve a cease and desist notice on me in order to stop, get this, potential future patent breach. Okay. So, like, that covers everything, yeah? Potential future patent breach. Every patent that exists on the planet ever, yeah? You, you could do that. And then I found out they've done it before. Um, they've done it several times before, in fact. Um, there's lock makers up and down the country that have tried to make the obvious tool, tried to sell the obvious tool, and the lawyers jump on them and say, no, 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 no. Now, I see why they do it, right? They do it to secure the lock. I understand why they do it. But this is security through obscurity again. It's not a model that works in the 21st century. You've got the internet, right? It doesn't make any sense at all. And it wouldn't be so bad if this lock wasn't everywhere. But, but it is, it's everywhere. It secures vending machines, gambling machines. Um, we saw one the other day at McDonald's. They've got tablets now, use this lock. And like, if, if it's taken us, what, one minute to work out what the tool's gonna look like, you can bet that the criminal gangs have got that far, right? And you'd think if it went to court, they wouldn't have a leg to stand on, right? But they also patented the obvious tool. <laughs> Publicly searchable patents, eh? Now, their intention, right, was never to actually make this tool. Um, I believe it was a defensive patent, purely. So that if ever someone did make the tool, they could say, oh, no, 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 you're going to breach our patent on it. And then I noticed this, right? This is another publicly searchable database. If you can't read that, it says, not in force, this patent was never actually granted. So, no, they haven't got a leg to stand on. But that's not the point, is it, right? The average tool maker doesn't want a long, expensive court battle. And that's the reason I know some of these other guys will be like, okay, we'll, we'll just give in and stop selling it. Because they've got rich lawyers and the legality of it isn't really the point. So like I say, this is an outdated protection method. This, this wouldn't fly in digital security, right? So let's say Microsoft bring out Windows 55 or whatever, and any idiot that looks at it says, oh, well, I can take an off-the-shelf product, modify it just a little bit, and totally subvert security. Now, would Microsoft sue them or fix it? You know, they'd patch it, right? They'd fix it. So we want security through design, not through obscurity. There's a big difference. And there's actually been... Um, more of a collaboration recently between lock makers and the lock sport community where there's been a back and forth so someone will find an exploit and the makers will go oh, okay thanks uh, we'll fix that and you know it's it's it it makes the thing more secure yeah that's the idea but this doesn't this doesn't help anyone this doesn't make the tool the pick sorry more <laughs> the lock this doesn't make the lock more secure at all does it this actually serves to keep it insecure it doesn't help anyone and I feel better for that. Okay, so this is uh, another lock that I worked on a lot. So in the 70s, right, there's this Finnish guy. This is a Finnish lock. Abloy make fantastic locks, by the way. If you don't know what this lock is, this is the Abloy Classic. And um, it's been around nearly 110 years. So it stood the test of time. It's a really secure lock. But back in the 70s, right, this Finnish pervert decided to make a tool for it. Called the Vempele, which is Finnish for contraption or thingamajig. So prior to this, in Finland, in the factory in Joensu, and I'm sure I've pronounced that wrong, there was a one million Finnmarks reward if you could pick this lock without prior knowledge of it and without damaging it. That, that disappeared after this. But this was the first recorded example of anyone having picked this lock. How are we doing for time? Okay, sweet. Okay, so we can go into what this Finnish pervert used to do, right? 
So he'd, um, he'd pick the locks often on, on young ladies' front doors. And what he'd do is he'd go upstairs and he'd lie in wait under the bed. And often he wouldn't come out. Often he'd just lie under that bed for days. Sometimes he used to attack the women and stuff and he, he got put in prison. But yeah, th this is one of those other examples, right, of why people want to pick locks. So anyway, this led Abloy to change the design of the tool. It made it so that the front disc span freely and you couldn't use it to tension the lock anymore. And it worked. And since then, allegedly, it had gone unpicked. So like when I heard about this, it was like, well, a red rag tool, you know, I've, I've got to pick this lock. I've got to design something. I've got to make something that picks this lock, right? It was like an ambition of mine. So on and off, six years R&D, design after design after design after design. I had to save up for a year in order to buy a milling machine just so that I could make the, the potential tool. Didn't even know who'd work or not, you know. But what I'm trying to say here is there was a lot of time and effort invested into this on my behalf, right? And it worked. Woohoo! Okay, brilliant. I made this is like the best that it gets for a lock tool maker. Mm. Yeah, without the million dollars. You know what? I actually got in touch with Abloy recently to see if that still stood. No, it's gone. Sadly. But it worked, right? So I was, I was super happy about this. Then I think it was three weeks. I got a message off someone. Oh, mate, it's good to see your uh, tools for sale on that popular Locksmith Supply website. I said, no, I don't think it is. Yeah, it is, it is. So I went and had a look, and I pretty much see my tool looking back at me. And I'm like, what? How can this be? They kind of copied it in three weeks, right? No, that's not what happened. Apparently, it had been developed for some alphabet soup agency eight years ago, secretly. And they saw it as an, as an opportunity to declassify and sell it publicly because the secret was out at this point, right? Which is exactly what they did. So this angered me, right? I'm not interested in making things that already exist. Who is, right? So I was really super annoyed, honestly. But I should thank them really, right? I didn't sue them. I didn't sue them and say, shut up. That's not true. It inspired me to make it better, okay? Which is how it should go in my book. So I'm actually gonna finish up now with a previous unreleased video. This is a secret tool of my own. So you're not actually gonna get to see the tool, right? Sorry, but you get to see what it's capable of. Okay, so this is me zero in the disc. This isn't the tool in the lock yet. But I'm gonna pause it when, it, when it's in. Okay, so if we pause it there, we're on what? Nine and a half seconds, say? Let's see how long it takes. I know how long it takes. There we go, it's doing its magic, it's doing its magic, it's doing its magic. I've paused it, it's doing its magic. <laughs> okay, there it is, lock open. 13 seconds. And that's, that's what happens when you usurp my tools. Don't do it is the moral of this story. Honestly, no, I should thank them. I should thank them. This would never have happened if it wasn't for that. Sorry? Uh, I've got a good idea, yeah, but um, let's not go there. And, th and that's it. Thank you for listening. That was Blackout Locksmithing. Any questions? Shoot, you know. Oh yeah, um, I'm going to be at the Lock Picking Village. So if anyone wants to come and chat or talk about any of the tools or anything else, you you, you can find me there after this. Okay, you're all welcome. Out. Hello, I have a question. I apologise. Yes, yeah, hello. that's fine. Um, out of curiosity, how long did the original tool take to pick that exact lock? Oh, okay, yeah, so I didn't actually show the original tool, did I? But um, it's out there, it's publicly out there, you know, anyone can go and see it on key picking, or, you know, it's, it's, on, it's out there. Um, so the original tool, depending on the skill of the user, that is, so like, uh, you do actually have to pick the lock. Right. Um, 
and it can take anything from, I don't know, a couple of minutes up to half an hour maybe. It depends on the lock, it depends on the skill of the user. But as you can see, that tool I just demonstrated takes no skill at all, a child could do that. So Cool. Cool, well yeah. done on that. Oh, thank you. Any more for any more? Why doesn't everyone use that phone booth lock which you said no one's picked? Why doesn't everyone use it? Well, okay, for ages it was on um, America's pay phones and um, they've just updated, they did, they used it for 15 years or so, but um, they've updated it with Medicos now, which actually aren't as secure as that lock, but you know, that's progress I suppose, eh? Um, what products would you recommend? What product? Yeah. What, as in what, what lock? Okay, so um, I don't think there's a lock on the planet that's unpickable. The, sorry? Yeah, the, okay, so the MCS is one of those mythically unpickable locks. Again, it's another one of my little pet locks, in fact. I love the MCS. Um, and I firmly believe it's doable. Um, and not even doable, I firmly believe that the agencies out there already have tools for it. The 3KS is simpler than the MCS. That, 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 yeah, so um, you could pick that right now um, if, if you had the skill, you know what I mean? But there are also other tools that are going to open it like that, you know? And, and that goes for pretty much every lock on the planet just so you can sleep safely at night. Uh, any more questions? Oh, there's a couple of guys over there and I'll come back to you. What lock do you use on your front door? <laughs> um, I don't mind telling you, it's an Ingersoll 10 lever. Um, you're gonna be lucky to get through it. I can't pick it. It's pickable, but um, I can't pick it. And it's actually a really good, it's a question that I ask other locksmiths because normally you get a pretty cool answer. Ingersoll 10 lever. There's another one on this side of the room. No? There's a guy up there. Another question for me. Um, what do you think is the next step in hardware security? Well, obviously, it's going digital, right? But um, that brings more problems than really it solves. There's, uh, I mean, look at the digital security industry. There's, there's just so many holes in it, right? And bringing that aspect into a physical security system brings with it a whole new raft of exploits. Um, so I think it's inevitable. It's going to go that way. Uh, just how secure it's going to be. We'll wait and see, right? But yeah, digital, it's going digital. Thank you I, do, I do always think there's going to be a place for physical security though. You know, there'll always be locks, right? I think. Any more questions? Yes. Hi, you said about the police locks and them obviously not wanting you to open them. But what's the alternative? Because obviously it's going to cost us a fortune to replace all the locks. And as soon as they replace them, you'll just work out to get around that one. So right, okay, that? yeah. So, so it's like this cat and mouse battle, isn't it? It's it's like um, it's like an arms race, I suppose. And um, I think that's inevitable with security. That's the that's the way things get better, right? And and so I, I welcome that. Yeah, hell yeah, spend the money. Oh yeah, well, that's always the thing, isn't it? It's always money against security, isn't it? it it's that like age-old dilemma. And um, if you want security, you have to pay, right? There's plenty of really bad, cheap locks out there that you can put on your front door, but you know, you'll get through them like that. It's, it, if you want security, you've got to pay for it. I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, did, have you thought about putting a patent on your lock picking tool? Okay, yeah, that, that's a very good question. Okay, so you saw the patent that that other company did. Um, short answer is no. It costs me £400 just to put a patent application in. And ultimately, it doesn't stop anyone from copying it anyway. Like, the Chinese, they don't care if you've got a patent anyway, right? They copy lots and lots and lots of tools. But um, let's say someone did that. Let's say someone copied one of my tools. You don't need a patent, right? If you can prove prior art, then you can prove that it, you have copyright on that tool anyway. So if it ever came down to it, I think I'd go down that route because I, I can prove that I've, you know, done X, Y, and Z, at, you know, X, Y, and Z. So, no. I, and the other thing about patents as well is that tool that was declassified after eight years, there was no patent for that tool because they knew it was publicly searchable and they didn't want people to see it. So often you won't get patents for tools like this. 
Yeah, uh, probably, probably, yeah. But I mean, like, I realised that they weren't having me on, that this tool did really exist for the previous eight years. It was just soul destroying, that's all. Is there a community of people um, designing better locks that are open source, that are better designed? There is one that I know of, yeah. Um, a guy called Michael Hubler um, did exactly that, like the open source lock, he called it. And it was meant to be um, sort of a community-based effort in order to get like the ultimate lock. Um, that's the only one that I know of. But um, you can find him on Lockpicking 101, LP 101, if, if you want to get into that. I've not seen it, I don't know. I have no opinion. I didn't get involved, sorry. But had I have got involved, it would have been awesome. We've got time for like one or two more. Are we done? Okay, well that'll do, right? Thank you.